Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Copenhagen, live in Copenhagen edition of the Monday morning introduction to philosophy and theory class. My name is Julian. I'm Jenny. And for the next 60 minutes or so, you can join us for an open access introduction to theory class. We're going to be talking about how to be a pervert like Zizek and what the fetish is. And we're going to talk about Lacan versus Marx versus Freud versus Zizek. So it's going to be a fun ride and stick around. If you feel like learning about those things, it's going to be an introductory class. So we're going to try to keep it as straightforward and accessible as possible. Um, and that's basically the plan. If you are joining us for the very first time, welcome to our learning community. Um, about a year ago, Jenlene and I launched these classes and we are currently traveling around Europe <laughs> teaching and, and sort of experiencing different cultures and countries. We are currently in Copenhagen. We are in Denmark. We're eating a lot of bread. Yes, we're drinking a lot of coffee. Drinking a lot of coffee. And nothing's changed actually. <laughs> That's sort of our <laughs> so usual. We always do. <laughs> and lots of bread, we're lots of coffee. Very much, very much enjoying ourselves. So yes. um, we just came here from Berlin. So a big thank you to all of the people who made our Berlin trip possible. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be in Copenhagen for a couple more days. Yes. And then I think we're going to Paris. And then after Paris, we're going to Bruges. Mm -hmm. And then after Bruges, we're going to be going to... Seattle. Luxembourg. No, Luxembourg. Luxembourg. And then back to Seattle. Mm -hmm. So very big thank you to everybody <laughs> who continues to support these classes, who helps us keep these classes free and open access, mm -hmm. and who also supports us in our travels. Yes. Um, if you'd like to financially support us, Jenlene also has an announcement. Julian's ebook is still available. Uh, you can also download these classes as a transcript. You can listen to them. You can join our Discord. You can listen to our podcast. Um, but most of all, we want to know where you are joining us from because, as Julian mentioned, we are doing a bit of a slow whirlwind tour. Uh, so let us know where you're joining us from, because it's really important for us that this is a global learning community, that it's open access, that um, all of our lectures are saved. We're coming up on two and a half years worth of weekly lectures. So Crazy. it's just been um, a joy to do. So check out our Patreon, link in bio. That's right, link in bio, or go to www.patreon.com dash... Jenaline and Julian. And Julian. <laughs> Exactly. Okay, now that we've gotten that out, of the <laughs> that way, out of the way, please do let us know where you're joining us from. I see someone from Poland. Uh, I see someone from Spain. And it, from India. It makes yeah. us so happy when people share with us where they're joining from. Um, and what's funny is sometimes we meet people by accident. Like, for example, someone sent us a message that they were working in a store and we'd actually been in their store, but they didn't say hello to us. And say hello. I, yeah, we just want to say again that if you see us <laughs> out there in the wide world, please do say hello. We're always happy to talk to people. We're always happy to say hi or take a picture or whatever. So uh, we love meeting people because otherwise it's just your names on the screen. And so if you do see us out and about in the real world, please do just say hi. We're always available for a chat and we love getting to meet you guys. Yeah. Um, okay, should it's we just... It's been a great trip, yeah. Oh, it's been such a good trip. Yeah. It's been really, really <laughs> Let's good. dive right in. Okay, <clears throat> today's going to be kind of a wacky class, because we're going to be talking about the fetish, and about fetishism, um, and, and sort of how, how fetishism works. And um, there's many different angles that we can approach here, but I want to start with a movie that I really like, and something that Lacan is famous for saying. So Lacan has this idea, you may well know it, where he says that the definition of a fool is a king who thinks he is king. In other words, a king who actually identifies with being king. It's a little bit like the quote-unquote alpha male who looks in the mirror and says, I am the man, I am the man. It's like over-identification with your symbolic order, your mm -hmm. symbolic attachment, is a kind of idiocy at that point. And... The perfect example of the king who is an idiot because he believes he is king and the disconnect of that can be found in Monty Python's, you know what it is. Oh, uh, Holy Grail. Exactly. <laughs> in which we have the character of the king who goes out into his kingdom and finds himself faced with a very practical dilemma, which is the dilemma of how he can prove to other people that he is in fact king. 
And that's also where we get some of the legendary lines from that movie, like the peasant who says, how do you know that he's a king? And the other peasant says, well, because he's not covered in shit. <laughs> and in a sense, this is it's what... It's a pretty good indicator. <laughs> yeah, but this is actually like the perfect encapsulation of the fetish of being king, which is that what makes the king a king, apart from the hereditary order by which he became king, is also the fact that the king is not covered in shit. In other words, the king is kept away from the world of shit. <laughs> and that makes the king a kind of fetish object. Mm -hmm. The entire society works because the one thing they know is that the king is behind the wall. The, the king is like a, a living totemic object. Mm -hmm. And of course, as soon as the king himself steps amidst the commoners, he too finds himself covered in shit. And thereby, in a sense, is no longer king. And the comedic short circuit of the king discovering that if he wants to be king, he's in a sense no longer king, that is the whole punchline of the entire Monty Python and the Holy Grail movie, which is kind of delicious mm -hmm. in a sense, right? The idea of the king who really thinks he is king. You could also think about it in terms of power when it comes to like political power, which is that what makes a good political leader isn't that they think that they have all the power. What makes a good political leader is that they realize that they don't have all that much power and that other people have to convince them to do things within the parameters of what they're capable of. There's this beautiful story from Nixon, President Nixon, who would all the time demand of his chief of staff various things that are utterly impossible. Like, I would like to have this person assassinated, or what if we start World War III right now, or let's nuke the Russians. And part of the job of being a chief of staff was to know the fine line between what does the king, what does the president actually want, and what is the president just saying? And in a sense, that's the political power that the chief of staff has to exert, which is to know when is the declaration of power actually a manifestation of the commander-in-chief's impotence. The more power the president wants to exert, the less powerful he is feeling. In other words, the more powerless he is in that moment. Of course, when you look at the Watergate scandal, mm -hmm. this was the sole instance in which the chief of staff actually did <laughs> what Nixon was demanding. Mm -hmm. And so we see a disconnect. There's this beautiful quote from President, former President Barack Obama, where he said that when you're president, one of the first things you learn is that there are no good solutions. Because if there had been a solution or an easy fix to a problem, it would never have reached his desk. Somebody else would have already fixed it. And so it's only the things that cannot be properly solved that land on his desk so that he can assume the authority of not fixing it. In a sense, that's the power of the king as fetish, which is the king isn't the person who can solve everything. The king is, in a sense, who has to absolve everybody else from that which cannot be done. And so we find the king or the president as this like ultimately powerful figure who finds himself pathologically incapable of actually enacting the kind of change, especially when it comes to Barack Obama being the kind of figure who is the embodiment of our hopes and dreams apropos change, the idea of an embodied figure of change. Mm -hmm. And that's, in a sense, the weird painful paradox of a figure like Barack Obama is that he embodies the idea of change precisely because he was able to deliver so little of it. And so in that sense, Obama is also a continuation. He's not actually revolutionizing anything. He was simply an image of change that allowed everything else to remain the same. Hence also people's disappointment. But of course, this ambiguity is already something that's important to note regarding the fetish, which is that this kind of ambiguity by which your expression of power is at the same time an expression of your powerlessness, we find it also within human relations themselves. Um, Jolene and I are watching a TV show that I really like. It's called The Hookup Plan, which sounds like a reality TV <laughs> show, but it's actually just a poorly translated French dramedy about a group of friends. And one of the friends is like the alpha male. And at a certain point, he he is being retrained by his <laughs> friends. His female friends. His yeah. female friends decide to teach him how to be a, a well-adjusted... Proper, proper feminist. A proper feminist, a well-adjusted man, a non-toxic male. And they have basically a list of questions that they present him with, like tests. And one of them is, when a woman says no, does no mean no? 
And he's like, is this a trick question? <laughs> because, and this is very funny because he says, initially he thinks, well, yes, no means no. But then he starts thinking about his history and all of his sexual conquests and his interrelationship with women. And then he says, well, what if she says no? And then he starts saying like, no in like a sexy voice, like, no. <laughs> and then his feminist friend sort of beat him up, you know? <laughs> but this ambiguity of no is of course exactly where we find the fetish, which is that there's a certain type in which no is expressed within the courtship process, the resistance to the initial courtship, which can either be interpreted as a prohibition, no, I don't want to be bothered by you, or a no, as in, I would like you to be more insistent. And of course, not being able to properly read those lines, that ambiguity, is in a sense precisely where the female power rests. That the woman can then retroactively insist that the no was in fact a hard no or a soft no. Mm -hmm. Now, this isn't to in any way argue against feminism or that we should argue, you know, in the defense of sexual assault or abuse. Clearly no means no. But being able to insist that no means no is specifically the female position in that regard. Now, here already we have another element of the fetish, which is that the fetish cannot be made concrete when it is directly observed. The meaning of the fetish occurs retroactively. I'll give you an example from Zizek. Remember the title of this class was How to Be a Pervert Like Zizek. Zizek says, that the figure of the pervert, and he has a story for this, is a man who loses his wife. His wife dies. And oddly enough, the man never processes his grief. He never cries. He never has like a period of mourning. Instead, the man becomes excessively attached to a pet hamster. And everything in his life revolves around this pet hamster taking care of it, calling it names, making sure it has the best food. Until one day, of course, inevitably, the pet hamster dies. And at this point, the man has a total mental breakdown, is in utter grief. Of course, you can immediately understand what's happening here. He's not grieving the hamster. He's simply having a delayed response to the grieving of his wife. In other words, having the hamster was simply a way of avoiding the process of mourning the original loss, which was that of his wife. Now for Zizek, this is essentially the position of the pervert. The position of the pervert is the one who finds enjoyment in the avoidance. In other words, finds enjoyment in what Lacan would call fetishistic disavowal. There's a disavowal of the original loss, namely the death of the wife, which is then in a sense projected onto the hamster which is a fetish thereby. And so we have fetishistic disavowal of the loss. This means that the enjoyment that the man has for his hamster, the love and tender affection that he shares with this relatively stupid animal, is in a sense the inverse of the love, the genuine love he had for his wife. Mm -hmm. And so the process by which the man loves the hamster is in that sense perverted because it has nothing to do with the hamster and everything to do with the fact that he cannot process the fact that he has lost the love of his life, namely his wife. That is fetishistic disavowal and what Zizek would call the pervert. The man who loves something because he cannot process the trauma of having lost that which he had originally loved. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, to take a step back, one way that we can understand this is to think about Lacan's theory of anxiety. Lacan and Freud have a very different take on anxiety. Freud believes that anxiety is all about loss. For example, Freud says that when you lose the mother as a child, not when the mother dies, but when you grow up, this is a loss that makes you anxious. And so everything that you do in your life is trying to make up for this kind of primordial anxiety that you really want to be back at the mother's breast. Lacan actually has the exact opposite version of that theory. As is true for Lacan most of the time, he'll take a Freudian idea, declare the seeming opposite, and thereby take it into a much more radical direction. And what Lacan then does is to derive a structural inference from that claim, in other words, to then apply the logic of this radicalized Freudian concept 
to a much more philosophical linguistic premise. Anyway, so for Freud, the idea is that anxiety is how you feel when you've lost the mother. Let's say that you're walking in a shopping mall and suddenly your parent disappears and you experience anxiety. Where are my parents? It's like the subject of many children's books is characters trying to find their way back to their mother. Are you my mother? No, I'm not your mother. My poop looks like this or something. Isn't there like a whole series about this? The, no, the mole trying to... Have you ever read this book? I think it's a Dutch children's book about a mole. It's very Freudian. A mole who like wants to find like his mother by... Right, identifying different animal poops. Animal poops, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, anyway. Now, where for Freud, anxiety is all about separation from the mother. In other words, separation from the object of desire. For Lacan, anxiety is about over proximity to the object of desire. In other words, for Lacan, it's not that we're anxious because we're too far away from the thing we want. For Lacan, we become anxious when we're too close to the thing we actually want. Mm. And here you can find like many beautiful applications. For example, think about that teenager that has a poster of like a pop singer on the wall or for could be Justin Bieber or something, or some more sexualized image, right? Mm. Think about a little boy who has, not a little boy, like a teenager, who has a poster of like some overly sexualized woman on the wall. Now, in a sense, if the woman on the poster suddenly arrived at his door unannounced, what is more likely, that the boy would, in a sense, succumb to his fantasy or that he would run away in <laughs> terror? Of course, it's the latter. <laughs> In a sense, if the woman of his dreams suddenly actually showed up at his door, he would run away. In other words, the attachment to the sexualized image isn't about wanting to, in a sense, have sex with that person. Yeah, it's not about the consummation. It's about the fantasy. It's, exactly. It's not the consummation. It's the fantasy. That's very well put. And the fantasy is there to keep the reality away in check. And so what the boy fears is sexual maturity. And the best way to keep that fear at bay is to have a poster of the idea of sexuality itself. And so if the parent is worried about the child having like this sexualized poster, it's not because the child will then become a predator and start chasing women and objectifying them. It's precisely that the sexualized image is the way in which the child keeps the horror of having to do it at bay. Well, I don't want to actually have sex with a woman, so I might as well put a sexualized poster of the woman on there. Mm -hmm. Here we come it's again. A kind of distancing. Exactly. And here we come again to the idea of the pervert. A pervert would be someone who then says, well, I never actually have to have sex. I can simply have the poster. I never actually have to talk to a woman. I can talk to the poster. I don't need to have a girlfriend. I can have a sex doll in my room. The person who never goes beyond the object, which is supposed to be the barrier to the thing. And what's so important here, and I really want to stress the structural process here, is that it's not that the sexualized image, the fetishistic object, is in a sense like the thing that I have instead of sex. It's because I fear sex that I have the sexualized image. In other words, my libidinal investment, the, the fetishistic object, isn't because I lack, in a sense, the actual thing. It's to keep the actual thing away. This is also why like the ultimate fetishistic object would be a not sexualized image. Imagine again, this is getting a bit ridiculous, but like imagine the pervert who has an image of like a stiletto shoe. The stiletto shoe would be two things. One, the absence of woman, namely only the shoe. Mm -hmm. But secondly, we end up in like a, this is also part of the appeal of like the sadomasochistic premise. If you are in a situation of sadomasochism, like bondage or something, and the whole point is that you don't do it. The whole point is that you are tied down and that the woman is in a sense dominating you, mm -hmm. that is a fetishistic attachment. It's a, it's a form of perversion in that non-normative sense by means of saying, the best way for me not to have to do it with you is for you to put your stiletto into my chest. Now, what's important here is that this isn't a judgment. It's not saying that this is something bad. We're not like kink shaming here. The point is to say that you find enjoyment in the seeming obverse, and not just in the seeming obverse, but quite literally you find enjoyment in the displacement of the thing you fear. Now let's go back to the, the, the story about the hamster and the woman. In a sense, the woman, the death of the woman, 
right, which cannot be properly processed and instead becomes made manifest in the fetishistic object of the hamster, this in and of itself is not perverted. Because inevitably the hamster will die. And more importantly, the man isn't saying the hamster is my wife. He's simply saying I cannot properly process my grief for my wife. Therefore, I have the hamster. And once the hamster dies, I will mourn her. If the man couldn't love the woman without the hamster, that mm -hmm. would be perverted. <laughs> I will have sex with you, but only if the hamster can watch us do it. <laughs> and here we find ourselves in the properly perverted position in the relationship of perversion to fetishistic disavowal. It's not just saying, I couldn't process this thing, and so now it returns. It's saying, I didn't want the original thing in the first place. What I want is the enjoyment of the disavowal itself. And here we find the perverted gaze. Namely, I don't want to be the active agent of sexual pleasure. I want to be the object of the gaze of the other. In this case, for example, the hamster. You're doing it with somebody else, but what you really want is to stage it for the gaze of the hamster. It's totally ridiculous and crazy, I know, but do you see what I mean already? Yeah, yeah, so there's a structural relationship here between the fetish and disavowal and fetishistic disavowal as such. Mm -hmm. I'm with you. So we're so good? Yeah. Okay, I'm having, a lot, I'm having a lot of fun with this. I didn't even really prepare this class because I was like, it feels weird to prepare it, so I'm just going to like just talk about it. Um, well, it's funny that you were um, talking about this because you and I started reading a short story by Gabriel Garcia Marquez that has a really great fetish opening, in a sense, that is the girl's long hair. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're going in that direction or not. Uh, no, I mean, we could mention the story. There's a, in, in the book is called uh, Love and Other Demons. And there is a bit of a fetishistic scene in there because the father doesn't love the daughter at all. In fact, he's quite content with the daughter dying until the daughter becomes mortally ill. And he's not afraid of losing the daughter, but instead he's afraid, he, what, he, what he likes is the process of losing the daughter. In other words, he loves the daughter more in the process of losing her. Yes. And it's because he is enjoying the process of losing her that he then decides to regain his faith. Mm -hmm. In other words, he finds his way- a father. Exactly, and so he's lost God. In this sense, the girl functions in the same way as the hamster, which is the man has lost his faith, and instead he has a daughter, and he doesn't like his daughter. And then his daughter becomes mortally ill, she has rabies. And it's not that he enjoys taking care of her, it's that the affliction that now torments her is a way for him to question God, which for him is a way to question his own disbelief, thereby to find his way back to God. And so she becomes the vanishing mediator of his own rediscovery of his own faith. And so she passes away. And it's a totally messed up relationship between a father and a daughter in which he can't love the daughter while she's alive and he can't love her while she's dead but he can love her while she's passing away. Right. And the passing away of his daughter is his opportunity to find his way back to God, the original loss, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, but I didn't want yeah. to do a whole... No, no, no. Um, I want to go briefly back to the idea of the fetish when it comes to the king, right? Lacan says that the ultimate idiot is the king who believes he is king. Now, in a sense, the king has to be idiotic in that very precise sense. There's this quote that Zizek likes to mention... Um, which is, uh, just because he acts like a fool and looks like a fool, don't let that fool you. The man is, in fact, a fool. <laughs> and, and this kind of fool is also the fetishistic fool. And what I mean by that is that the position of monarch is precisely to live in a totally separate space by which everybody has a fetishistic attachment to them. And Totem and Taboo, Freud writes about this, how it's impossible to touch the monarch. There's a great scene in the movie Hero. Hero is a, I mean, that's a translation from a Chinese film. And the plot of the movie Hero is that there's an assassin who wants to assassinate the, I guess you would call it the, em the emperor, the, emperor mm -hmm. the Chinese emperor. And nobody's allowed to get close to the Chinese emperor. He's separated from his own bureaucrats by a large staircase or a stairway. And the more honor you have as a fighter, like the more treasures or like accolades you receive, the closer you're allowed to access the king. And so what the assassin does is that he assassinates his fellow conspirators. They give up their life. And with each of these bounties that he collects, he's allowed to step 
one step closer to the king. But what's very beautiful, and this is spoilers for Hero, what's very beautiful is that by the time the assassin has come closer to the king than everybody else, he suddenly ceases to be an assassin. In other words, at the exact moment that he is so close to the king that he can touch the king and kill the king, he suddenly succumbs to the king's point of view. And he says, actually, I no longer want to assassinate you. Actually, I now believe in your project of imperial domination. And that's exactly what that distance is, which is that what we fear, in a Lacanian sense, isn't the loss of an object. What we fear is over-proximity. For the assassin, over-proximity to the king is finding the point of view of the king. And this is kind of an interesting thing, because if you think about what, one of the facets of liberalism, one of the key, key facets of liberalism is this idea that we should always inhabit the other person's point of view. That, you know, for example, a, a terrorist is somebody who had a bad childhood or simply processing trauma, etc. Now, even if this is true, it doesn't take away the fact that this idea that we simply put ourselves into the eye or the position of the other already suggests a kind of power imbalance. It's the same power imbalance that works within the logic of tolerance. Who gets to tolerate whom? It's not that I put myself in the eyes of the terrorist. Uh, sorry, it's not I put myself in the eyes of the terrorist so that the terrorist doesn't have to put himself in my eyes. In other words, the thing that we find really dangerous about terrorists isn't the idea that they want to, you know, blow up the World Trade Center. What we really fear is that they might actually want to do it. What I mean by that is that as long as we rationalize the reason for their violence, oh, they had trauma in their past, oh, you know, they were indoctrinated, oh, they're just, you know, manipulated into doing this, in a sense, it protects us. Because the truly horrific insight would be to say, no, what this person actually wants is to kill us. This person is actually a fundamentalist and he fully associates with his own fundamentalism. And so the very process by which we say, well, he's a terrorist because he had a, you know, an abandoned childhood, whatever, is a way of us protecting our own sensibilities. This was kind of interesting with like Osama bin Laden. I remember that when Osama bin Laden passed away, um, even earlier, there was they were finding all this information from his life, mm -hmm. like all the, the, the everything that had been found in like the caves that he'd been living in, etc. And the disbelief from the Western journalists was always, he actually lived in those caves because there was this narrative that he was simply like an opportunist who was using this entire thing of, of international global terrorism as a way to find own political power and advancement, etc. Mm -hmm. The horrific insight for most Westerners was that this man is deranged and as evil as he was in that sense, actually believed it. He actually lived up according to his own ideals, etc. And so the ultimate thing that you can do to disenfranchise somebody isn't to say, oh, they were the ultimate evil, but it's to say, actually, they weren't evil enough. In other words, the ultimate way that you disenfranchise somebody is by accusing them of hypocrisy. Like, think about someone like Gaddafi, for example. It's easier to make fun of Gaddafi and to say, well, he was simply crooked and corrupt, etc., than to say he actually believed all the things that he was trying to advocate when it came to, like, the unity of African nations, etc. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to accuse your arch enemy of being a hypocrite than to accuse them of actually believing and buying into the thing that it is. Mm -hmm. The point being, again, for example, when it comes to liberal tolerance, that the idea of liberal tolerance, which is supposed to bring us closer together, let's just see the world through their eyes, is actually a way of keeping us further apart. It's actually a way of maintaining the power structure by which we're the ones who get to tolerate somebody else. We're the ones who actually get to rationalize why they're acting in the way that they do. Am I going too fast with yeah, that? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you. I'm trying to think about if, the, if we can also say that about white supremacy, if there's the same phenomena that exists. The, the liberal response is to just say, oh, well, it's not individuals that are racist, it's structural racism instead. I mean, yeah. both can be obviously true. But to say that someone who is genuinely... A uh, racist. I, mean, I feel I like how I'm... we're I like how we're doing everything we can to make this video not suitable for ads. By the way, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> um, okay, so we're talking again about fetishism, fetishistic disavowal, mm -hmm. and about how that process works. Right. And I need to, I need to get back on the rails mm -hmm. a little bit when mm -hmm. it comes to that. So we're talking about the movie Hero and this idea of distance and proximity to the king king the emperor is like a totemic object 
and that the whole point is that you can't get close to the king because the closer you get to the king, the less king he is in that sense. Well, and the more you go undergo a perspective shift, is that part of the point or is that... Let me, let me phrase no. it totally differently. Okay. One of the things that, for example, Donald Trump always insisted upon was this idea that if only you got to know me, you would know that I'm actually just a really nice guy. And at the same time, he would be saying things like, I can act with total impunity, I could shoot somebody on the street and it wouldn't matter. So here we have these two levels. We have this idea that I'm so far above you that I don't function according to the laws that everybody else applies to. And at the same time, if only you could rise up high enough to be in my inner sanctum, then you too would realize that actually I'm a nice guy. In other words, your disbelief at my audacity is a sign of how poor and how low you are. And that if only you rose up to my circles, you would see the world as I see it, in a sense. That promise was always implicit in the whole Trumpian approach, which was to say that the reason you don't understand me is because you are so inferior to me, which is kind of messed yeah, up. Yeah, no, that's a really helpful way to characterize that. Does, yeah. that, does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. Um, anyway, I don't want to dwell too much on Donald Trump, but it's kind of interesting, some of those things. I'm going to mention another scene. We're going to pivot slightly. Another scene from the television series we're watching, The Hookup Plan. So there's a couple, man and woman, and they really want to have children. Except they're struggling to have children. And so they have all these different ways in which they try to induce. But before they actually have any kind of medical treatment, they try it with all kinds of like spiritualistic things. For example, they wear necklaces that are like supposed to like make you more fertile. And they always carry around like a totemic, like a goddess of fertility, like this African statue. And the woman insists that when they have sex, that the African statue is there watching. In other words, that it's almost like you're having sex to procreate, not for pleasure. And the key sequence in the in the series is that at a certain point, when they have failed to procreate, and they've also lost their enjoyment of sex, they then decide to have sex simply for pleasure and not for procreation. And then at that point, they kick away the goddess of fertility. In other words, the goddess of fertility, in that sense, had been the fetishistic object that was supposed to observe them copulating so as to create children. But then their sexual enjoyment is precisely the sexual enjoyment that is precipitated by kicking away the statue. In other words, what turns them on is no longer each other. What turns them on is saying, we no longer need to perform sex for your gaze. And this is exactly how we can understand the difference between the Sartrean gaze and the Lacanian gaze, which we talked about in one of the previous classes. For Sartre, the idea of the gaze is simply the idea of how you interact with others, how you, how you identify yourself. For example, you look in the mirror in the morning and you think, how do I want to appear to other people? Well, I'll look in the mirror because the mirror will give me a more or less, a more or less reasonable depiction of how I might appear to others. And so we dress ourselves anticipating being seen by the other. Lacan is again much more radical here. Lacan says, you're not seen by others, you are seen by objects. And here we find exactly the gaze in a Lacanian sense, which is that this couple is trying to procreate and the statue of fertility is watching them procreate. Now, it doesn't matter that the statue isn't actually watching them. If your procreation is staged for the enjoyment of the goddess, then you find yourself in surplus enjoyment, which is now if I turn the goddess away, I'm enjoying it even more because now I'm doing it for me. And the exact same thing applies in countless romantic movies where a couple wants to make out mm -hmm. and they see a picture of the parent and they turn the photograph of the parent away because they can't have sexual enjoyment while the parent is watching. Here we find the next step towards the pervert. The pervert is the person who doesn't turn away the picture, but instead gathers all the other pictures and puts them on display. And I think we literally, I'm trying to remember which of the which of the Jane Austen novels it is, or maybe it's one of the film adaptations where they do it because the picture is watching them. We'll, we'll find things out. I can't remember what it is. And so the point is, if you're having sex, but you have to make it so that the picture is looking away from you, that is not as enjoyable as the perverted stance, which is to say, now I'm going to have sex with all the pictures watching me. In other words, my enjoyment isn't just the enjoyment of copulation. My enjoyment of doing it for your gaze. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's an application of that for how things work today. Because 
every time you step into society, you're doing it for the gaze of the other. Lacan simply extrapolates from that Sartrean idea, the idea that we don't perform for others, we perform for objects. And this is the key Lacanian insight, we perform for objects so that the object appears as a subject and we ourselves can seem like objects. In other words, go back to the picture, the picture of grandma watching you do it, you've subjectivized the object of grandma, the photograph, so that you can feel like the passive agent of her disapproval. Mm -hmm. In other words, you find this like useless precaution of turning the picture towards you so that the picture, which is an object, can take on the subjective position in your imagination by which I become the object of your, let's say, libidinal investment. And this is exactly Lacan's ultimate argument, that the way in which you access subjectivity is by becoming object to, a, to another object which has been subjectivized. Now, what is the ultimate example of that? Christ on the cross, right? You put a cross in a room, and suddenly, I am the object slash subject of Christ. But it also works in the exact inverse. Remember, there's something perverted in the Christian gesture, which is to say, I am going to die on behalf of all of your sins. That is the perverted gesture within Christianity, <laughs> which is to say, I am not just dying. I'm not just having the subjective experience of death. Instead, I will become the object of death, the subject slash object, on behalf of everybody else's sins. The perverted stance here is that I'm not just dying for me, I am dying for you. Mm. And so the actualization of the death of Christ becomes the mediation of everybody else's lived existence. That is the perverted stance within Christianity. Does that make sense? So I'm right? with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> I know we're doing like a lot here, but like it, like it makes- That was a, that was a death, death pivot. <laughs> Christ is the ultimate pervert. But now you're also starting to understand a little bit more what Zizek means when he talks about perversion, mm. right? Which is that per the pervert is the person who isn't assuming his own enjoyment, but is assuming the enjoyment of the other. In that very sense, Christ is the pervert because Christ isn't, isn't assuming the position of his own death. He is assuming the position of having died for everybody else. And this is, in a sense, the perverted aspect of all sacrifice, mm -hmm. right? When you say, I am sacrificing myself for you, for Lacan, we always should be very suspicious. Lacan is totally anti-sacrifice. Lacan says, every time somebody sacrifices themselves, we should be suspicious about the secret perverted enjoyment that they're deriving from it. Mm -hmm. Now, who's the ultimate pervert when it comes to sacrifice? Mothers. Mothers. Mothers, when they say, could be fathers, of course, I gave up my life for you. 20 years of my life, I did nothing else except take care of you so that you could be a person. Now, that is the perverted stance within motherhood, which is that I gave up my life so that you could live, but now I have to disavow the fact that I secretly enjoyed it. Yeah. That's how you find enjoyment. Mm -hmm. It's also the perverted stance within all parenthood, right? The idea that you set aside 20 years of your life at least mm -hmm. on behalf of this child, which then assumes all your hopes and dreams. Yeah. Presumably. I would much rather um, bake a cake in a stifling hot kitchen if it were for you. And I knew that I could say to you, I suffered in this hot kitchen. Because if I just make it for myself, then it's like, why am I, why am I miserable yeah. in this hot kitchen? Yeah. I'd much more enjoy doing it and then saying, you really owe me. Yeah. But, this is ex but, but this is also like, if for Lacan, the ultimate like freeing, uh, the liberalizing gesture is to realize that you are your own symptom. <laughs> This is what that means, yes. essentially. <laughs> um, yeah, but but look, this doesn't have to be all bad. Like, there's this quote that I really like from Albert Schweitzer, a German theologian and mathematician, who has like a formula of enjoyment. Something very Lacanian here. <laughs> no, no, this is a precursor to, is, he's Lacanian avant la lettre here. He says that, Glück ist das einzige, was sich doppelt, wenn man es teilt which he puts in like a mathematical formula, essentially. He says, enjoyment is the only thing that doubles when it is divided. Ooh, and here we find really the formula nice. of the perverted stance. <laughs> now, the, what's really important here mm -hmm. is that to share something makes it more enjoyable, right? You enjoy a meal, etc. The perverted stance is to say, I'm not enjoying sharing it with you. 
I am, I, am, I am dividing myself on behalf of your enjoyment. In other words, the self-flagellation, which is I am now dividing myself into on behalf of your enjoyment. That is the perverted stance. This is also the sad, the, the, the beautiful slash sad perversion within the idea of the clown or the comic. Uh, there's the famous story of Pagliacci. There's a town in which a clown, a famous clown has arrived, Pagliacci. And one day, a man comes to the doctor, and he says, Doctor, I'm so sad. I feel suicidal. And the man says, Oh, well, I have the perfect re remedy for you. I hear that the clown Pagliacci is in town. Go to one of his performances, and I assure you that you will immediately regain joy. And the man starts crying, and he says, But doctor, you know this one, right? Don't you see? I am Pagliacci. <laughs> Of course, this is exactly, again, Pagliacci is the man who dies on the cross for everybody else. Pagliacci is the person who, who, who makes everybody else happy. He cannot enjoy his own jokes. Exactly. Pagliacci is the one person who can't enjoy his own jokes. The pervert does enjoy his own jokes. The, mo like, the definition of the pervert, if you will, is a man who cracks jokes and he's the only one who laughs at his own jokes. That is the perverted stance essentially. I am the object of your own enjoyment channeled through my own enjoyment. That is the perverted stance. Yeah. It's also the problem of, but this is the problem of all ownership is that like you direct a movie and you can't see it as a movie. Mm -hmm. You have a child mm -hmm. and you can never see it as anything else but a bundle of all your own failures. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this is the process by which our, our very like over proximity to the object of desire is what we fear and that we lack a distance. It's the classic idea when you're writing is how can you be a judge of your own writing? Well, step away from it until you are no longer the author of the text, mm -hmm. until you no longer inhabit that own space. What we fear is over proximity. And so the barrier that we place between ourselves and the object of desire is the fetish object. In other words, here's the basic formula that we've been trying to approach throughout this class. What is fetishistic disavowal? Well, if anxiety is the anxiety of being too close to the object of our, of our desire, then we create a barrier between us and the object of our desire. And this superficial barrier is called the fetish. And it is fetishistic disavowal because we are disavowing the original object of our desire by means of inserting the secondary false thing. And that is fetishistic disavowal. It is the love of the barrier. Mm -hmm. Something similar ha happens within the idea of melancholy. You've probably heard me say this before. When you're a melancholic, when you're suffering from melancholy, it's because you've lost something, but you've fallen in love with the loss itself. In other words, you've said, the one thing I still have is my pain, and that's what you can't take away from me. That is fetishistic disavowal. Okay, I wanna wrap up a little bit. You can, you can already start sensing here that we're approaching an argument that goes beyond a Lacanian concept. Namely, Lacan's an idea about Freud. He says that, it's actually an idea about Freud and Marx, which is that Lacan argues, and Zizek actually talks about this at length in his book, The Sublime Object of Ideology. In The Sublime Object of Ideology, Zizek says that Lacan said, right, he's quoting Lacan, that it wasn't Freud who invented the symptom, it was Marx. Marx invented the symptom. Okay, so how does that work? Basically, it's about understanding the commodity fetish as a unique type of fetish. And if you want to understand the commodity fetish, you have to start with the king. Let me explain. If in a feudal society, we have the king as the totemic object, as the fetishized ruler, the ruler that we cannot come too close to lest the entire hierarchy collapse, we realize that the king is just another guy instead of the sun god. Here we have the fetish of the master-slave society, as Hegel would call it, as the relationship of dominion, which is that we have a ruler and we have those who are ruled. The fetish in this society is simply the fetish of the idea that the king is the rightful ruler. It's like Robespierre said with the French Revolution. There's no point putting the king on trial to determine whether or not he is a good king, because the whole problem is that he is king. As long as you're trying to decide if the king is a good king or a bad king, you haven't structurally addressed the problem, which is the problem of kingship itself. 
The whole point of the revolution is to get rid of the monarchy, not to create a better monarchy. And so the fetish within a feudal society is precisely this idea that the king is inherently innately king so that we can all be free citizens of the king. As long as you are within that relationship of dominion, that is the fetish, the relationship of fetish to the idea of the master. Now, within the commodity fetish, the idea, and remember, this is really key, and many people don't appreciate this about Marx. The commodity fetish is supposed to be a good thing. The commodity fetish is supposed to release you from the feudal relationship. Because if the way in which society is structured is no longer about the innate ruler king and all of the you know, subordinate, subordinate, citizen, no, it, yeah, subordinate citizens, instead for Marx, the idea is supposed to be that with, with trade, with the exchange of commodities, we essentially have a society in which it doesn't matter whether you're a king or whether you're a citizen. The whole point is that as long as you can pay for something, let's say on Amazon, nobody's going to ask you like what family you're from or like how many titles you have or something. The whole point is with money, everybody can buy anything. It's essentially an equalizer. Yeah, no, noble titles were the original non-fungible token. <laughs> like different yeah. titles had different meaning. Yeah, and that's the really... idea is with currency is that all currency is fungible. Is fungible and equivalent. So That's it doesn't a, matter if the dollar is coming from a rich man or a poor man, the dollar is just a dollar. It's a beautiful way to put it. Yeah, that's no, excellent. That's right. Very good. And so Marx essentially posits this idea that the commodity fetish is replacing what we could call like the feudal fetish mm -hmm. and that this is a good thing. But here's the key part that Marx argues. If you don't realize this part, you've completely missed the argument, which is to say, Marx says the commodity fetish is supposed to replace the fetish of the master and slave, except something much more sneaky happens, which is that the master-slave relationship of inequality becomes transposed to the commodity fetish, and yet it is disavowed. In other words, what Marx basically says is that within industrial society and early capitalism, the master-slave relationship, the idea of kings and lowly peasants, right, those who are covered in shit and those who aren't, is essentially maintained within the commodity, the society of commodities. And so instead of having money setting us free and money making us all equal, money retains inequality under the name of equality. Mm -hmm. That is the Marxist idea. The commodity fetish is simply the process by which we remain unequal under the guise of being more equal. Or in like George Orwell has exactly the same in Animal Farm when he says that we are all equal, but some are more equal than others. And so suddenly, instead of saying we have king who is up here and citizens who are down here, we have everybody is equal, but some are more equal than others. And those are the ones who live in the gated communities, etc. <laughs> And so Marx's argument is that what should have liberated us from the feudal fetish, which was the disavowal of the king is actually a person, has led to the commodity fetish, which is the disavowal of the inequality that remains embedded within the idea of equality itself. In other words, that we don't have two sides of the coin. It's not saying on the one hand we have inequality and we have equality. This is also why the liberal argument that like the way to tackle inequality is to simply make society more equal falls apart. The way in which structurally inequality is maintained is precisely by insisting that everybody is equal, that everybody has the same challenge, the same op opportunities of participation and so on. The more we insist on the fact that we want to make poor people more equal, the more we've rationalized the innate inequality necessary to continue capitalist exploitation. That is Marx's argument. And so what Marx is arguing, it's not so much about commodities, it's about fetish. It's about the fetishistic disavowal within a bourgeois society, which he calls bourgeois morals, by which the more we pretend that our society is actually about equal opportunity, the more we can uphold the innate structural inequality within that society itself. And so in a weird way, this makes capitalism a less honest society for Marx than a traditionally feudal society in which you have someone up here who was born into it and someone down here who was born into it. Within capitalism, when we look at it, like all developed societies, the, the primary indicator of your success in life is the family you were born in, the property that you own. We've maintained the feudal hierarchy, but we decided to simply insist that it is equal. And that is what Marx calls the fetish. 
Hence also why, to go back to the original argument, Zizek argues that Lacan argued that it was Marx who invented the symptom, not Freud. Because capitalism is in that precise sense symptomatic because the very energy that goes into the exchange of commodities and the pursuit of happiness and riches is precisely the process by which we all tell ourselves that it is not because we are all chasing the higher rung within an unequal system, but that we're all in the collective pursuit of a more equal society, a more perfect union. Mm -hmm. And that fundamental disconnect is what Lacan would call the symptom and what Marx calls the commodity fetish. And so the very way in which we enact our own existence within the structure becomes disavowed. That is the disavowal that Lacan refers to as the symptom, that Marx refers to as the commodity fetish, which has to be upheld through what he calls bourgeois morals, which is what Zizek calls ideology. Ideology is the process by which we learn to act and believe in the system as it is, as active agents. That's basically it. Does that all hold together? That holds together. All right, cool. I'm with you. Then I think we should just wrap up here a little bit early today. Sounds good. I think we should wrap up. I like that. Well, we're going to take this to Discord in a few minutes and maybe talk about this a little bit more. Because I think that uh, in the previous classes as well, you've done a nice job of linking it back to capitalism and exploitation. Uh, and we actually had some questions about that. So cool. maybe we'll do a little bit of that on the Discord. I just want to say that, like it was super fun for me to teach this class or this lecture. <laughs> like I really like talking about perversion and... Weird, weird sex stories <laughs> and linking all of that back to the idea of capitalism is super fun for me and I hope it's also been enjoyable for you. Um, if you if you just tuned in, you can watch this entire thing on IGTV where we're going to save it or you can also download it as a podcast if you're a patron and if you want the more condensed version, I also have an ebook. It's called Five Keys to Zizek. It is less than 100 pages. It's a pretty easy read. You can probably get through it in about a week. Or if you're very ambitious in a day, <laughs> it's called Five Keys to Zizek. It's available exclusively for patrons. And um, I'm sure that my goal is basically to like take what I think are the most important ideas that Zizek has, the ones that I feel like you need to know. And I've put all of those into a very short ebook. So if you'd like to download that ebook um, and also thereby support these classes, you can find that exclusively on Patreon. The link is www.patreon.com. That's Jenny and Julie. Uh, someone says, how do we get on Discord? The Discord is our first tier on Patreon. It's $5. Um, and all you have to do is click the link. And we will get you signed up in the next five minutes or so so that you can join us for the live Q&A. Because we always do like an extra bonus hour where we take your questions and we record it as a podcast exclusively for patrons. On that note... Thank you guys so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for you, starting your week with us. Thank you for joining us here live in Copenhagen. Yes. And next week we're going to be in Paris. So, on that note, <laughs> see you later.